Okay, this is the pre-class video for uh, RPH 140 World Philosophies, the summer of 2021, the July 26th class, class number 15. And we're going to be working in on hum, uh, Hinduism. And it would be Hindu humanism because it's uh, interpreting, understanding, Hinduism through the lens of the classical virtues. Um, I think this is a fair understanding. I don't think you're over reading or trying to ram Hinduism through some Western um, set of categories. But so, so uh, the thing I like about Houston Smith's book is that he is clearly in love with each of the religions that he studies. He himself was the son, a Methodist preacher's son, and I was a Methodist preacher's kid, and Methodism is very tolerant. They emphasize the union of reason and faith. John Wesley put everyone in his church in a separate circle. He would join a circle and meet during the week, and then you would just talk about your faith journey and you would, um, uh, some scholars had sort of read John Wesley's sermons and recognized patterns. And um, it was called the, the Wesleyan quadrilateral that you were supposed to synthesize uh, reason and faith, scripture, tradition, and experience. So you would talk about your experience of the week. You would be educated in the tradition of Christianity and the tradition of Methodism, what people in the past have done that they thought was consistent with Christianity. So pros and cons, you know, mistakes they made and achievements. So you learn from history, scripture, of course, but reason united with faith. So you can't read scripture in a way that contradicts reason or that makes you one of the people that history has said they thought they were Christian, but it didn't turn out well. So you learn from history um, and then you improve your, your experience, right? You don't just uh, describe your experience. You figure out, well, what, What's the direction I should go to create experiences that you think are more consistent with um, humanist Christianity? So Houston Smith was raised in that tradition. He, he lived in China. So he appreciated Confucianism, like the founding fathers. That's, I'm sure he was very aware of that. And so now we read, we've been reading Hinduism. And I have connected it to um, a lot of current day events, experiences. So I connected it to personality types and the way that we secularize that and monetize that. So corporations would use personality um, inventories. I mean, it's not bad, it could be a win-win so that you match the personality to the job and people are more productive because they're happier at work. That's perfectly fine. Um, the downside of it is that, um, how about if you wanna change or what if you're perfectly happy in this job except you think your company is breaking the law, right? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're being asked to do something you like to do like maybe you're a natural salesperson, but you think the company is breaking the law in what they're telling people about the product or what you're told you have to tell people and what the research actually uh, says, you know, something like that. It never, the personality inventory does not account for evil. None of those personalities is evil. <laughs> They don't say, now watch out for this type because they're going to be the dishonest salesman or they're going to be the one 
that cooks the books when you're not looking because they're the introvert, you know, that likes to work with numbers. So this is what you got to watch out with that one. <laughs> None of it ever says that. So it is a very distorted view of the human condition and very American in the sense of the enlightenment was project was to try to get rid of sin. Of course, there were plenty of fundamentalists that came over to the US that actually thought we're born sinners, we stay sinners. So we have this really conflicted culture, our culture, you know, that in the religious sector, a huge percentage were people are born sinners, they want to sin, blah, blah. But in the political sector, it's the enlightenment, people are blank slates, and they can use reason and they can work together and they can create a middle class and they cannot behave in sinful ways when they're acting as citizens. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is the tradition that you've been handed down. I would say Americans and American culture is still extremely conflicted on all of those things. But anyway, so the other thing we covered last time was the creation stories. So the idea that the notion of God created the heaven is very problematic. It's always been problematic. But in Hindu, they have multiple creation stories. There's no single God and there's no single moment. And this God, God, there's no God that has control. It can actually change the, the karma. You know, karma can actually blow up and start all over. No, it's just this constant emergence. And you can, you can cr create better karma or worse karma. But the universe isn't going to change or go away anytime soon. <laughs> and so there's not a personal God who's kind of going to come in and change everything just, you know, to punish you or to please you or whatever. Um, so I, but in, within the Judeo-Christian tradition, there always were scholars and people who advocated for a more impersonal energy kind of God. And then they would refer to the second creation story because the second creation story is a lot like that. So there are two creation stories in the Old Testament. Um, then the Bhagavad Gita is about a conversion experience. So I talked about turning around and the students each talked about their own experience with conversion, different kinds of conversion. There's social justice conversion, intellectual there's all sorts of kinds besides just Christian or just religious. Um, then we talked about stress, another current issue, and how the Hindu, um, all their, all the rituals, the yoga, the diet, the, there's the music, all of that is really designed to get your inner life much more stable and peaceful. Um, we talked about, so, so Western science uses these machines to prove and show empirically that actually Eastern mysticism isn't so uh, off the wall. It's very scientific. It was tested through experience. Um, it's not blind faith in the East, and it's not anti-intellectual. Those are stereotypes created by Westerners to marginalize um, Hindus. Um, and then we talked about whether stress was a cultural product, whether the society sets you up for stress, and you do need to think about that, and then you need to think about how to get out of it. And especially your phones are designed to stress you out, so you have to decide what you're going to do about it. Um, then, then the students each talked about which path, what do you really want at this time in your life, and then the four paths, pleasure, success, duty, turning around, or just to stay in touch with the Atman, the piece of the infinite that's inside of you. And when you try to get in touch with inner peace, you know, when you try to develop some inner integrity, step back, how do you do it? Do you do it through reflection and knowledge? Do you do it through love, relationships? Do you do it through work that, you know, I show my faith by doing something? Or do you do it 
through yoga, those kind of exercises that will really drive your psyche inward. Um, and then most Hindus are encouraged to do exercises every day. They, they all have to do some work, right? Go out in the world and, and move your body and work, fulfill the various duties, and then love. Everybody has some kind of relationships. But the two main differences are people who get to God through love and relationships and people who get to God through reflection and study and knowledge. Okay, so philosophers in general are more the reflective types. Um, doesn't mean they don't love people. i am got my swimming suit on because I'm going to go to the pool with my grandkids soon. <laughs> so it's not that way, but um, when push comes to shove, that's what I used to think about in third grade, God was energy. So that those are just, uh, again, those are innate. Those are personality types. Um, then there's four stages of life. I think you should think of yourself at this time as a student um, and trying to learn as much as you can. And then there's householder. Hinduism is really different from um, other traditions in the sense that you have um, achieved, right? The goal, if you step back, step back. And as you're really old, you just become a beggar because you're that detached from the world. And of course, in the US, that is not the way it works. When you retire, you were, you know, you're twice as active running around doing all sorts of stuff you couldn't do when you're working. And then you fight death to the end and all sorts of operations and therapies and you name it to fight the dying process, which I think is really irrational and stupid, but it's rewarded in our society. And then there's the four stations, people who are creative, they think of ideas, they need to be writing or uh, dancing or playing music or um, engaged in theology, philosophy, that's also a kind of creative, creative resetting your mindset. So I am asking you in this class for your final paper to um, create a worldview and that's a creative i'm asking you to to branch out and try to be a seer right a visionary create a vision for yourself for your society for other people um, some people are managers just naturally and um caitlin said she was more of a manager and i think as i recall um mary hannah and um Titus said they were more like team players, which is more like the producer, the one who gets told what to do, but but works with other people really well. Like that would be an administrator's dream employer employees. They work together. And then there are people who really like to work with their hands and they really want to be out doing construction or um, something with their bodies and with their hands. So we went through all of that in general. And um, I think I like Hinduism. What I admire about it is that it's the oldest religion of the ones we know. Of course, that's not really true because there's indigenous and Hinduism really isn't a religion, but it's very old and it's time tested and the yoga and the breathing and the food and the chakras, they all were discovered over time. All right, so today we are going to do a whole lot more things with Hinduism. There's an article in a book, The Justice Men Owe Women. So in theory, Hinduism is about energy and the most respected way to God is to think of God as energy. Well, energy is not female or male. So in theory, there should be no sex on sexism and there's gods and goddesses, right? There's no, the three major gods have three goddess counterparts. Um, in the stories, there's plenty of goddess energy and um, uh, Brahma was, and there's stories about Brahma and his cohort and how closely related they were. 
I mean, there's just a lot of positive stuff about goddesses and goddess energy, but that's not the way the orthodoxy came down. So this happens in Christianity and it happens in Confucianism. Um, the way uh, a way of life, a wisdom tradition gets co-opted by the culture and the culture is patriarchal. So the code of Manu was written by Hindu Brahmins who have power and wealth and they were sexist. So they wrote a code where your sacred duty for women is very sexist, right? They're supposed to be subservient. I mean, it's pretty appalling <laughs> and it, it doesn't fit. Jesus, Buddha and Muhammad were all um, really uh, pioneers at their time in terms of respect for women. Um, and Gandhi uh, also, um, was sexist in his orientation. His personal was one of his personal weaknesses. How to lead a household life. Women are supposed to accept abuse. So the religious practices all focus on purification and sacrifice, which is always tough on women because women are considered impure, like menstruation is often considered an impurity, which it isn't, like it's the power of life. And so you, you get suspicious when the very indication that women have the power to give life <laughs> becomes not only ignored, not only marginalized, but demonized. Ah, uh, that's, I get suspicious, right? So the death and burial women are widows are supposed to jump on the fire that their husband's bodies are being um, burned. And um, you could say that that was for economic reasons in a very poor country. Uh, nobody could afford to take care of this widow. She couldn't get a job. She had no skills, but <laughs> still that's not a very good solution. Um, it's called Hindu Sati. Um, the Sanskritization, as the, as the standard of life went up, women were even more closeted at home because when women had to work in the field, it was a sign that you were too poor to keep your women at home. Um, so I actually, I teach students from Nepal and in other countries that are Hindu. And my students tend to be from the little villages and they still do arranged marriages at very young ages. Um, the school I teach at is mostly Muslims in ben Bangladesh. And there's, Bangladesh has a terrible problem with child marriage. Um, girls as young as 12 are handed over to old men. Um, it might even be younger than that, but it is truly awful and their lives are over. But anyway, that's, there's, this is all culture. It doesn't have anything to do with the religion. That's my main point is to distinguish between when you're studying a religion, like we did the day before. And it's like, it's interesting. It has a lot to say. Karma, you know, that makes sense. And then you look at how it got embedded in the culture and it got sexualized. And, and then you go, wait a sec, this is awful, but this isn't Hinduism. So, and I do want you to, to go through that with Christianity. Christianity was very sexist, but most, um, you know, my students can identify as conservative Christian women, but they want equal treatment in school. They want equal treatment and getting into college. They want equal treatment and getting to med school, law school. They want equal treatment and employment. They want equal housing opportunity. <laughs> they want all these things that until recently, if you were Christian, a woman wouldn't expect it until very recently. Just, you know, when I was born, this was not true. When I was in college, this was not true. So it wasn't that long ago. So just try to remember that, right? This is a pattern 
and we haven't escaped it yet. Um, but certainly, you know, as a woman, you'd probably rather be born in the U.S. But that isn't necessarily because it's Christian. It's more because it's humanist. It's the humanist side of the Christianity that pushed women's rights forward. Conservative Christians fought against women's rights for a long time. Um, let's see, knowledge of the one is genderless, right? Um, the doctrine of reincarnation. And then they, of course, that gets used. Um, that if you were reincarnated, if you're a woman, then you're a younger soul and you have to just be an obedient wife and then maybe you'll get reincarnated into um, a man if you're lucky. <laughs> um, yeah, Kali is a powerful goddess. Um, the doctrine of nonviolence. Um, it never got practiced, right? It never got institutionalized into practice. And there's the problem with people personally can be nonviolent, but the structures, the institutional structures pit people against each other. Um, and then there is institutionalized violence against women. I think really you need to read this, you need to know this. I've, I signed it because I just think, yeah, students need to know these things and they need to compare and contrast with our own situation. Um, is the cause that we don't have dowries because we're more virtuous or because it, because, well, we believe in human rights or, you know, I do not want you to think that nobody is born more virtuous than anybody else and nobody's doctrine makes them more virtuous. You know, embracing a doctrine is not virtue. So um, there are plenty of women within the Hindu tradition that don't accept any kind of sexism and they, it's not Hindu, it's not authentically Hindu. Um, how do you overcome these entrenched traditions in the sense of associations with Hinduism? Yeah, women are, are polluted. I have a student, Pula, who told me that her mother told her she was polluted during menstruation. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so um, the solution is education. There's two kinds of texts. This is true for every religion. That which is heard, right? The revelation and then that which is written down, right? And that often gets corrupted or reinterpreted in ways that really conflict with the original spirit, okay? So Jesus said, he who has ear, ear, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, he who does the will of the Father, he condemned the Sadducees and Pharisees for their hypocrisy because they could quote from the Old Testament and use the Old Testament to justify their way of life, but it was wrong, it was corrupt. Um, so I will talk about, um, I asked you to read this article, uh, Gandhi and the One-Eyed Giant. And let's see, it's 15 pages, something like that. I always have you reading. Yeah, you don't have to read this next part. It came after 9-11 and it was written by Gandhi's, I think, grandson and about nonviolence, how we should react. Well, I guess I will, I will have you read that. Um, we did take revenge and we shouldn't have because our leaders directed us to take revenge against Saddam because our leaders wanted to invade Iraq for cheap oil, not because Saddam was the source of the terrorists at all. And they knew that. So that's, you know, what we get. The American public deserves uh, what one point two trillion dollar, two trillion dollars in war, and you know everything that's happened since then was because we were ignorant and we wanted revenge. 
So, I mean, let's learn some lessons, guys. Um, all right, the wisdom of the Buddha does not fit here, so I will take it out. These are, I will talk to you about Gandhi's life. You can page through that if you want to, but I will spend some time on that. Um, let's see. Oh, so I've got a double one here. So that's, oh, I got a triple one here. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, okay. This has a few more quotes at the end. So I will, um, I'll take that one. Um, all right. So then we have, last time I had you read Hinduism and the environment. So we'll go over that. And it should make sense to you that um, Hinduism would not advocate environmental destruction and would be very much in favor of sustainability. That should just make intuitive sense. Um, and so this article just gives you a good explanation and some history behind what intuitively should make sense to you. And then, again, a matter of time, but I have some slides, some Hindu slides. And my main point here is that in the ancient wisdom tradition, the arts were extremely important. The artists were the educators of humankind because they educated your emotions and your, in your vision of a good life. So between the music and the dance and the stories of people acting nobly in the face of threats or people in the midst of the struggle between good and evil and choosing good over evil and all the stories have all these evil characters so that you're aware of all the ways you can go wrong. Stories have good intentions gone bad. I mean, it's all education for character and your intellectual capacities are secondary, right? They're linked to your moral capacities. So there's plenty of people in every ancient tradition stories that are smart but devious, right? They can, their smarts is controlled by greed or lust or power lust. And so, you know, they're very similar that's why I like to go back to Aristotle's virtues. But I will show you some of the slides and then I'll ask you to write about your reaction, which slide. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna, far I'm gonna get in the poetry. Do you think poetry is different? You could answer that question anyway. Do you like poetry or not, as opposed to doctrine? Uh, there's singing um, in general, what place, does art play in your own religious experience? Um, I know some people for whom a work of art sort of converted them. Well, I know one person who, I think he was raised Presbyterian, but he went to a Catholic church service and the Catholics truly got all of their art, their theory of art, their way of doing art and their way of linking art to religion. They stole that from the Greeks. Truly, historically, literally. And they couldn't convince the Greeks to um, convert unless the, until they hired all the best artists and made the most beautiful church and just put Jesus on there instead of um, the Greek gods. And that worked. And so they kept that tradition. So the Catholic tradition is a, has beautiful art. I, I was raised in the Benedictine community. I mean, it was close to my house. And yeah, the arts are huge. And I live with the, with the nuns every summer and the arts are truly big. So I do want you to just reflect on that a little bit. Uh, Presbyterianism, Protestant church, the, um, there was a lot of anti-art in Protestantism. And so you should think about your own experience with religion and the arts. And we'll go over that too. So, um, I think that's that's it. Um, nothing fancy. I don't think I have too much to add, but um, I look forward to seeing you tonight. 
and I will have gone swimming with my grandchildren, I think. Uh, I haven't done that for, a, I mean, I haven't gone swimming for a long time. I don't know about you all, but I come from Minnesota. I used to swim all the time. I used to swim across a lake and back. Because anyway, life goes on and I will see you soon. <laughs>